Hi there, today we have Mary Lee from Cornerstone Home Lending answering all of your questions about the financial piece of the home purchase. She comes to us with 25 years plus experience in the industry and we cannot wait to pick her brain. I'm really excited to be here and look forward to answering all your questions. Yeah, so let's get started. First things first, how to choose the right lender. What sort of questions should we be asking Mary when we're interviewing lenders? That's a great question. I would ask, first of all, how long has the lender been in business? the loan officer, and then how long have they been with their company and what are the credentials that the company has? Do they send their underwriting and processing to, I don't know, Minnesota, or is it done in-house? It's very important that you ask these questions because it, it's the timeline for your contract mm -hmm. depends upon how fast you can get your file into underwriting and out of underwriting. That's a good point, and I guess tell us what the difference is between doing underwriting in-house or, or out of house. Is that have to do with how long it takes? Why is it important to have that underwriting in-house? I have my own underwriters at Cornerstone Home Lending. I have my own jumbo underwriters and conventional underwriters and FHA underwriters. And what this means is when we get a file in and we put it together, we know it's going to a certain underwriter. And so we know that that turnaround time is going to be 36 to 48 hours. And so we count on that file coming out of underwriting with conditions. And we, so we, we can plan that through the process of a contract. Okay, great why you're never late on closing loan, <laughs> which is what we love about yes, you. We, we, are, we don't miss closing dates. You give us a contract with a closing date and foreseeing anything that a title commitment or a title company or something happens to the borrowers, we'll make that closing date. Right. So one of the third, first things we tell people to do is to get a pre-approval letter. Can you explain what the difference is between a pre-approval letter and a pre-qual letter? Another good question, yes. A pre-qual letter is just an interview that I have with the borrowers that we write down what their income is, what their assets are, what their liabilities are, what do you think your credit score looks like, and then you're pre-qualified for a certain loan amount based on your down payment and what you think your credit is. A pre-approval takes it to the next level. We want them to apply, we want them to get their income documents in, pay stubs, income tax returns, bank statements, 401k statements, so we can look at the whole picture and then that way when we send the letter, there are two different boxes on the letter today. One says we verbally discussed everything, which as a seller, if you get a letter that says we verified everything or we just talked about it, you're going to accept the one that has this check mark that says we verified everything. So the pre-approval comes with actually verifying all the documentation. Gotcha. So the Great. difference is pre-qualification is more of a verbal, Correct. you know, conversation versus where you have pre-approved someone, you've actually verified their documentation. Um, why should someone get pre-approved? Well, if you're looking at houses in this very heavily trafficked market, meaning I don't mean heavily trafficked as far as um, going in and out of houses, but we are seeing three and four offers on houses every single contract that at we least. get. And so to get our clients physically prepared, we want them to be able to get that pre-approval letter and we give our borrowers the ability to do their letters on their phone. We, we preset the parameters so on the weekend, if you can't get us, then they can go into their account with our borrower portal called LoanFly and do their own letter. Gotcha. And then send the letter right there, that way we don't miss out on the opportunity of getting them that contract. Well, that's, that's really amazing. convenient. So what does the pre-approval process look like? How long should I expect it to take? How do I initiate the process? And what can I expect to have to provide to you? <clears throat> well, the first thing comes with a conversation with me and we go through everything verbally. And then I meet with our transaction coordinator and I, we get a checklist put together. And the standard checklist is most recent two months of pay stubs, W-2s for the most recent two years, income tax returns, bank statements, verification of either rent or if you're renting from a private individual and we get all of that in and then we go through everything and we do our verifications to make sure that everything is true and correct. Um, we do a verification of income if they are salary plus bonus or they're hourly, if they have overtime, we have to check all of that to make sure we have enough income to satisfy the debt to income ratio. So. In terms of credit scores, everybody is trying to get their credit scores as high as they can so they get the best possible interest rate. 
Um, what will happen to my credit score once I apply with you? Is my credit score affected? How will it be affected if you pull credit on me? It's another great question. You're allowed to get four different lenders with your shopping to pull credit, but I wouldn't do that at first. I would just interview a lender before you decide on who you're going with. And remember, cheapest is not always the best. If you're looking for cheap rate, something that's going to get lost along the way, like customer service or closing right. on time. <laughs> uh, we've, we've had experiences with that, that. right. Uh, but the other thing is that um, the pre-approval process and the letters that go along with it, if you apply today, we could get you a letter, and you got us your documents in a timely fashion, I'm going to say within three to four days we're going to have a letter out. Right. If I get everything in and go over it, I'm not an underwriter, I've done this for 25 years, I know what they're looking for. So if we have the credit scores for the program, if we have the down payment for the program, if we know your debt to income ratio satisfy the program guidelines, we're going to get that letter out. Great. So just to go back to the question about the credit score though, Oh, I'm sorry. Does it lower my credit score to have my credit report pulled, or, or well, how you can have it up to four lenders before it'll have an effect. If you're doing it once, no. Okay. Absolutely Great. not. But the things that you need to look for as far as maintaining a higher credit rating is on your revolving credit is the best way to maintain that. So if you have a credit card that's got a thousand dollar limit, don't charge a thousand and ten dollars. Right. <laughs> keep that. <laughs> keep that at a thirty percent. Ratio. So if you have a thousand dollar limit, don't go over three hundred. Right. If That's you go advice. over it, pay it down because you're demonstrating you've got that ability. You're not maxing out your credit cards. Right. Installment loans are different. Pay those loans on time. Don't miss the payment because that all adds to the mix. And there's different grading criteria for your revolving credit and your installment credit. So revolving credit is like a credit card, whereas an, an installment is more like a car payment. Car payment is that yes. correct? Or, or if you took a 401k loan out or something, a, a, a loan, if you went and got a... A, a fixed payment. Basically. Yes, correct. Yeah. Okay, that's great. So the other question you know, we get from a lot of people is what helps determine my interest rate? I mean, why would I get a 2.5 interest rate and somebody else would get a 3% interest rate. <clears throat> Several years ago, both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac changed how we give interest rates out. If you have two borrowers and one score is lower than the other, then the interest rate's tied to the lower of the credit scores. This is actually very important because it is a, a common misconception. So if you are applying for a loan with another person, your spouse, your partner, what have you, you do not uh, the person with the lower credit score is actually the credit score that they will review. You don't get, a lot of people think it's like a blend of the two and it's not. It's straight the lowest credit scores. So that's good That's the interest rate, right. And sometimes we've had married couples that we couldn't use either the spouse, right. the wife or the husband because the scores were below the, the acceptable 640 credit score. So that was another question. What is the minimum credit score to apply for? 640 and conventional. Okay. 620 for FHA. Okay, good to know. And don't marry somebody without good credit. That's exactly they right. Check when you, their credit. When you're dating well. somebody, you want them to slap <laughs> Not just their background down. check, also a credit, credit check report. as yeah, well. Absolutely. Um, but there yeah. are options, right? If you know you guys are a married couple and one credit maybe isn't as good as the other, if you can qualify for the mortgage on the person's income alone who right. has the better credit score, you can just have them solely on the loan. That. Right. Yeah, so um, that's something, an option that you can do too. The um, other thing is we have a, um, a software program through our credit reporting, uh, Credit Plus, it's called Credit Expert. And we can take a, a couple's credit profile, the three different bureaus, and say what, can we get up 20 points or 30 points? And that might make a difference. And so when we do this, we sit them down with the expectation, you may have to pay certain debt down to qualify and then we rescore, hopefully we get the scores up and they can buy a house. Well, that was the next question. Mary, you right. just <laughs> can read our <laughs> minds. The know. next question uh, was, if my credit score is not the best, you know, what can I do? There's a lot that you can do, but it's not a hundred percent perfect. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen every time. We've had really good success with it. And laughingly, I tell my clients, stay on the Mary Lee green line, don't get <laughs> off. Because if this is what you want to do and this is what you want to have happen, we're working with a couple right now, they don't have to come up that much, but it's it's getting them to do that, which is discipline. I mean, we all like to say, yes, we're disciplined and we're really not, 
but when it comes to your credit, you don't want to be able to not buy water. And that sounds really silly, but <laughs> if you have a low credit score and you're a spouse or the, uh, or the husband, you can't do anything. Uh, you can't go rent a, an apartment. They're going to check on that. They may charge you more rent for that. It all has to do with risk management. So when we put you on a profile of paying some things down, not off, but just down and redoing your credit score, it's going to make a difference. Right, and I think some people don't understand because I know I didn't understand when I was younger that more credit does not no, always improve no, no. your credit score. Um, and that I think the one piece of advice that you gave about the 30% ratio is really sound advice to try and keep your credit, well, absolutely. try and keep your credit cards your below balance is a, 30%. Yeah, so sorry. Uh, percent that what we like to see is maybe three credit cards max and maybe a car payment or two credit cards what underwriting is looking for is a 18 to 24 month history on these accounts so if you come to me and you've got a five month you just open accounts all five months old that's new credit right. and it's called thin credit and there are certain guidelines for thin credit may not on the conventional be able to qualify for a mortgage FHA but then your ratios get tighter and they come into play so the house you wanted to buy may not be what you can afford because you've got thin credit right so when I look at thin credit I say okay we'll see what we can do on the FHA side however I would tell you to go get let more time get between these accounts that's going to give you a broader history because the longer you go on the stronger that number of your credit score is going to be so the biggest effect I guess in the immediate sense of helping your credit score would be to pay down some of your debts, is that? Correct. And then about how long would it typically take to see some sort of improvement? That's a million dollar question. <laughs> uh, credit rescoring or, or getting your credit cards to update. Credit card companies don't always, you make your payment, they post it, it may be three months later. Right. And they'll give you your on time, but they're not going to show that you really paid it down to a, a level for maybe five or six months. So we, right. if we have to do that, then we've got to go upgrade the credit reports and rescore for clients who have paid things down. And they think so it's is it usually immediate. a couple of months? Or? It, it could be, it could be as much yeah. as three months. Okay. Um, we've seen it take a, a lot longer than that. So I have one other question in regards to this. When you say you really would like to see two or three credit cards, so say somebody has 10 credit cards. They have a Neiman's credit card and a Barney's credit card. Barney's, they, they're not. Are you asking for sorry. a friend? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe myself. <laughs> no. no, I'm just curious though, because I've heard different things. Do you, should you get rid of the credit cards that you don't use? Or should you not cancel? Like, I know some people have said, okay, well, don't cancel any of your credit cards because that will lower your score. If it you will. Can. You're so, closing uh, existing lines of credit. If you have 10 credit cards, pick the two or three that you're going to use the most, pay the other ones off, chop them up, put them in a drawer, don't use them. But don't cancel the but accounts. But don't cancel the accounts okay. because you're closing open credit lines that will have an effect if you just close them. Right. Well, I mean, it's taking away a portion of your open credit lines. Exactly. So your credit score that your credit percentage you're using will. But if you're taking those other line, two so. or three and using them, those others are going to fall off, and you're going to get a more consistent grading of the ones right. you're using. And I'm not. I don't mean to beat a dead horse with with this subject, but I think a lot of people really don't understand how credit scores are what they are. You know, I used to think that, oh, well, you know, I make all this money and I buy, you know, I, I buy an intensive car and I've got this and I've got that. <laughs> and that all means I have good credit. Well, it doesn't mean you have good, good credit. credit. So it means you can afford the payment. Right. Yeah. What we're seeing today is that it really has just come about since COVID. Everybody has medical collections on their credit report. For some, it could be a $10, it could be $1,000, but it's having more of an impact today on credit scoring than it has ever had before. And we're, we're wondering, why is this? Because it's, it's an open derogatory account right. that would not come into effect, but now it's coming into effect big time for credit scoring. And it's just been wow. amazing to see somebody with perfect revolving and installment debt maybe have two small medicals and it knocks their scores like down. Like you had a blood test that you forgot to pay well, for. Well, something like that. I don't know. Yeah, it's crazy. Or you went to the hospital and maybe it had, a, and you paid all your hospital bills, but you had a... Uh, 
an x-ray that, that didn't get paid for, for by your insurance company, yeah. but you didn't know it was on there. Right. right. I mean, I've had that happen with a couple of people. Yeah. So. so, you know, I think the most important thing is, you know, we've said this in our previous segments, it is never too early to reach out to us or to a mortgage professional to start talking about the process because even if you're a year out, um, to really understand your current financial situation and your credit score and how it will impact what type of mortgage you have is very important. So um, I'm sure we could talk all day about this topic and if you guys <laughs> want a special segment on credit scores, we will definitely do that. But um, long story short, there are things that you can do and Mary Lee is a great resource um, if you want to talk further about how you can improve your credit score. But there are a couple of things that, uh, a couple of terms we were using, you know, over the past few minutes that I do want to clear up. The next subject we're going to talk about are the different types of loan products. And two big ones that, you know, we were kind of alluding to previously are FHA versus conventional. Can you talk a little bit about what those two terms mean and, and what the differences are? FHA is normally seen as a first time home buyers program. It's a federal housing administration. It's three and a half percent down. You can get the down payment from a family member. Your company can give you a gift. We can do down payment assistance. There's several different ways to get it. On the conventional side, you have to prove you've saved the money. You can get a gift, but nine out of 10 times, people have to prove that they have the, the, the ability to save that 3% minimum up to however much they want to put down. If you've got 5% to put down and your parents or grandparents want to give you a gift, it's fine for both different scenarios. One of the major differences in the two programs is that FHA has mortgage insurance that is on the life of the loan, regardless if you pay it down to 70%. Conventional, the mortgage insurance drops off when you reach that 80% threshold. What is mortgage insurance? Mortgage insurance is insurance that is on the loan in case you go into default. On the conventional side, 20% is the cutoff that if you have an 80% loan, you have no mortgage insurance. Meaning if you bought a $100,000 home and you had an $80,000 mortgage, you don't need mortgage insurance. If you bought that same $100,000 home and put 10% down, that 10% difference between the 90% and 80% carries mortgage insurance that will fall off when your loan to value gets to be 80%. So it's basically additional insurance that yes. the lender carries Correct. for you putting less than 20% down Correct. and the risk that that loan carries. Correct. But you're saying for FHA loans, it does you have that for way. the life yes. of the loan. So, so that's good to know. I have a couple of questions just to go back to two things before we get too far down the, the road because you mentioned one of them. Um, a little bit about down payments, but what is down payment assistance? And how do you, how do you know if you qualify for that? It's income driven. We have a lot of clients that use it. Uh, there are different programs available through the state um, that we submit the loans to. And what it is, is there's a different scale. You can submit for 3.5% down, 4% down, 5% down. And what happens is, if you go for 4% and that each of the entities, 3.5%, 4%, 5%, has a different interest rate because you can imagine if you need 5%, 3.5% of that is covered the down payment, the rest of the 1.5% goes towards your closing costs. This kind of gets confusing, so if you need help, please give me a call and we can walk you through this. These loans are income driven. There is a maximum amount of income per the county that you're in. Okay. So every county around Harris County is a little bit different. And I want to say the maximum loan amount maybe, or the maximum uh, two income family is like $90,000 okay. max. Okay. Uh, so then we have to make sure that we meet that criteria that they haven't owned a home in the last three years, how many people live in the household. There's a lot of different moving parts to this. Cornerstone underwrites the file mm -hmm. and we close the file because we do so much in down payment assistance and then we send it off to TDHCA, which is Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs, and they're the ones that service the loan. Okay. So there's a max amount of income. Is there a max purchase price? Well, for based on the programs? income. It's okay. just based on that income, yes. Well, if you're a first time home buyer and you don't have the, the, the down payment and you want to go buy a $145,000, $50,000 home and you qualify for that, then you can use down payment assistance and you can build. Yeah, that. no, it's great. I mean, it's a great way for somebody to buy their first home or to buy, yes. you know, 
in that price point, yes. Yes. So we did have a lot of questions about first time home buyer programs. I don't know if we pretty much covered that with FHA. Are there other first time home buyer programs? There is a conventional 3% program and that's truly, you have to truly be a first time home buyer. FHA, you can use it and not be a first time home buyer, okay. but most first time home buyers do use that. But the 3%, you've got to be a first time home buyer. So why would, you know, let's say I am a first time home buyer. What are the pros and cons of going the FHA route versus a 3% down conventional? Interest rates will be lower on FHA. Okay. Mortgage insurance is more expensive on the conventional 3% down because it's, okay. it's risk. FHA has a, a, a factor that's used on all the loans for the mortgage insurance, so and that's not so much used on the 3%. FHA underwriting is kinder and gentler to the first time home buyer, <laughs> in my opinion, uh, versus the conventional. Okay, well that's good to know. So, the, and then the other question I had, just because I know we've had these discussions about different different people purchasing, FHA is not just for first time home buyers. No, you can use it again. The other thing about FHA, you're allowed, the seller can pay all of it, uh, your closing costs in FHA, which they're limited to on the 3% right. conventional. And most of our clients that use FHA want down payment, I mean, a closing cost assistance. Okay. And it's is there a maximum purchase amount on an FHA? 346 in some change here in Harris County. All the different counties are a little okay. bit different. Okay. And how many years, I guess, since the last time you bought your home? have to have passed to use For a first time home, oh no, you don't. On FHA, you can, you can oh, so I could buy a home and sell one and buy the next one on oh, FHA. Oh, okay, good to know, yeah. When you're looking at my file, what are the main factors that you're going to be looking at when determining the amount of the loan that you're willing to extend to me? What we do is we take your income once we have gone through a verification of income, either salary, bonuses, hourly, and we have a factor, and that factor is 43%. And we multiply what we can use as income by 43%. Then we add up your debt, subtract the debt from that 43% number, and the rest will be used for principal interest, taxes, and insurance. Meaning, if I've got $1,500 left over, I've got to figure out, well, taxes may be $350, right. insurance may be another $175, there may be an HOA for $75 a month, if there's mortgage insurance, I usually figure that in at the end when I come up with a number. So I've got a calculator and it says this amount is good for a loan amount of 185000 Gotcha. So you're looking at my monthly income and you're saying about 43% of that Correct. minus you know, my current debt. debt obligations. That's the pretty much monthly payment yes. that I can handle. Correct. Okay. Well, that's the factor. Now, jumbos, there's a hard stop at that 43%. What is a jumbo loan? A jumbo loan is any loan amount that goes under over $548,250. And there's a different underwriting criteria for those mortgages. Underwriting is very, very hard stop on 43% of the income. Whereas on a conventional side, loan amounts for less, we might be able to go up a little bit with compensating factors. Good reserves, which means... 401ks, bank statements, savings account, uh, a nice down payment. FHA will let you use a little bit bigger debt to income ratio, okay. but not exorbitant. So it just has to be able to go through Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac's underwriting system. And we have to get what is called an approved eligible on those loans to go through underwriting. What is Freddie Mae and Fannie Mac? What is that? It's Freddie Mae. <laughs> I mean, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, <laughs> they are the entities that buy all the mortgages in the secondary market and they make up all the guidelines. Okay. So those are the guidelines that we have to go through and look at and say, okay, we do this, we do that, we do this, and knowing what exactly to do when we get a file into underwriting. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, we're gonna do a little bit of a segment on construction loans because we did get a lot of questions about this. Um, people who perhaps bought a piece of land and wanna build a new construction home, how do construction loans work? So if this does not apply to you, you can just fast forward you know, a minute or so, but that's what we're gonna cover right now. So um, I hear that construction loans maybe are some of your favorite. They are, they are my <laughs> favorite. Uh, I enjoy working them through the process, not just through the underwriting process, but, but 
structuring the loan because yeah. that to me is a fun part. It's, so it's, tell us about how that loan is structured. Let's say we're starting with I found the perfect lot. You find the perfect lot and you give me a call, Mary, we, we want to buy this lot. It's uh, $150,000. It's 20% down. It's an interest only program. So the 20% down is going to be uh, three hundred. No, it's going to be, what, $30,000? Yes. Yeah. So you've got some equity in a lot. It's an interest only. What does that mean? That means, that, let, let's say the interest rate is uh, four and a quarter percent. Mm -hmm. It's four and a quarter percent times 120,000 divided by 12, and that's your interest only payment. So my payment is really just the interest it's on only. the loan. I don't Correct. have to pay a principal amount. No principal. Not, you, you can if you want to, but most people don't. Then you decide, I'm going to go to houseplans.com and go find that perfect house plan. You get it the way you want it. You get a builder to give you a price. Let's say the price is 300000 So the entire mortgage amount, the value, has to be $450,000, the appraisal. Right, because it has to be the land plus the, the bill. Yeah, yes, and so then your down payment on the construction part would be 15% down. The $30,000 you gave on the lot loan will go towards that down payment. Great. Then you go into underwriting to make sure, again, your debt-to-income ratios are good, your credit's good, the reserves are good. There is a reserve requirement of 10% post-closing. Half can come from your 401k, half has to be in liquid. So if you're, is it 450,000, 10% is what? 45,000? Yeah. Half can come from your 401k, the other half is liquid. Okay, that's good to and know. And you don't have to give it to anybody. I tell our clients this all the time. We just have to show it. So we that you that. have it. And then you go to closing. Your builder comes to closing. An M and M lien gets placed on the property. Your builder, we step back and let him decide the um, draw schedule. Okay, so let's go the for the lot loan. How long do I have between when I initiated that lot loan and? finding a builder and you have two years two years okay and then um, I close on the next loan the construction loan before we we start construction is that correct, correct. well the, there's two ways to do it you can do it two times lot loan and then the um, construction in our cases most of our folks buy the lot first and then go into construction because they don't have their plans together right uh, we did a, a loan for the head of West Side Lexus or North Side Lexus that was building in the woodlands and he came to me and said, oh, we've got the lot, uh, we want to close in six weeks. I said, do you have your plans? Oh, I don't have my plans. <laughs> and I said, well, you won't be ready. Oh, yes, we will. I said, well, you go find out what you need to find out and get back to me. And he called back and goes, it's going to be six months. <laughs> so, well, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so it's important that you get your plans exactly the same, the, the, how you want them. Then the builder's got to price everything you want in the house. Mm -hmm. And so that comes into budget. So what we do is we set your budget up ahead of time, mm -hmm. like qualifying for the purchase of a loan. Mm -hmm. Here's what I want to do, how can I get there? Right. And so uh, it's, they're, just, they're easier to, to do than getting you into a, a purchase transaction because underwriting's easier. Well, that's good to know. So you mentioned the draw schedule. So once you close on the construction loan, what is the draw schedule? How does that work? The builder will sit down and figure out how much he needs at the first draw, and the first draw is going to be really a form survey of, of you'll, you've seen them when you've gone by house construction sites yeah. of the, the wooden structure that looks like there's going to be a foundation for it. That's called a lot survey or the form survey. Then he'll get a draw for what he needs for the different phases. There's, so you don't just give him the lump no, sum? No, 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 no. It all, all gets put into an account, and you, you as the purchaser or the client has to sign off on the draw schedule. Gotcha. He so can't just go ask for $60,000. Yes. Oh, and then we send a, an inspector goes out there to make sure that the work that he's done is the work that we're paying. That was going to be my next That's question. Yeah. 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 No, you, you inspect cannot, what he's yes. doing. So. Absolutely, yes. And then you'll do, okay, so then afterwards, I think other people were asking, um, do you refinance that loan into a traditional mortgage or how you can do that work? there's two ways to do this you can do a one-time close after you bought your lot into one time through underwriting it's an interest only period for the construction then you roll no underwriting you roll right into your uh, 30 year amortization or 15 year amortization based okay. on the interest rate we closed you or you can 
look at it and say, you know, interest rates are really low right now. We're going to go to Las Vegas with the rate and we're going to make sure that, <laughs> that uh, uh, it's still going to be low. So right. then at the end of the term, six weeks before you get your occupancy permit and whatever entity is signed off that everything's correct, you come to me and say, okay, we're ready to start the refinance process. So then we will refinance you out of that loan into a fixed rate loan. And what is the period of time after you begin construction that your construction loan is interest only payments? It's 12 to 18 months, depending upon what you need. 12 months, absolutely. If you need six more months, then we can arrange that to happen. So it just depends upon how long it's going to take to build a home. Okay, and if for any reason, this usually does not happen, but if for any reason there is money left over from the initial construction budget, what happens then? Well, you don't use it, so the loan amount is reduced by that amount. Okay, good to know. Okay, so that's all we have on construction loans for now. If you have more specific questions, again, you can reach out to us. You can reach out directly to Mary Lee. We will give you her contact information at the end of this video. Uh, but we're going to go back to kind of your traditional, you know, purchase, uh, resale of a home. Um, so tell us a little bit about the process. So we've gotten pre-approved. We've found the perfect house. We've gone under contract. What can I expect now? What we do is, I have a team that we work with, uh, Martin Lopez is my right arm, and once I deal with you and take care of all the things that we need to take care of, Martin will then call you and say, when are your inspections going to happen, because we don't want to order an appraisal until you're cleared on your inspections. Once we get the green light to order the appraisal, we get that appraisal ordered as quickly as possible. Now we can stop it at any time, hopefully they haven't gone out there, should something happen in the mix. but. Well, that's okay. So that's a good point. So right after you go under contract on a home, you're most likely what's you're most likely going to have what's called an option period. So that you know seven to ten days is your unrestricted period to cancel the contract for any reason. And generally, in that time, you're going to have the inspections that she was talking about. So let's say you found something out in the inspection that you weren't pleased with, and you decided to cancel the contract. They don't, the lender does not send out an appraiser until after that period is over so that they know you're definitely going forward with the home. But let's go back to the appraisal part. What is that and why is it important? The appraisal is established the value of the home. So if you're under contract for 400000 and the appraiser goes out there and he looks at all the data that has been homes that have closed, take a pin and drop it on the house you're going to buy and do a circle for a mile around. He's got to go find comparables that have sold in that mile radius in the last three months to, right. to establish value as a comparable. He can take some adjustments to it, not major adjustments, mm -hmm. but some adjustments to it. And he gives us a report that we give to you because you pay for it that establishes the value of the home. And that's really so that you guys know that you're not lending on a but property that's correct. not worth what correct. you know yes. you're lending on. Um, so tell us about after the appraisal, what more can I expect in terms of what I'll have to provide to you? What kind of communication do we have back and forth all the way through closing? I think we have a great communication tool through our software program that we have because real estate agents and the buyers get notified when you go into underwriting, when you come out of underwriting, when the appraisal is ordered, when the appraisal comes back. Martin Lopez, my right arm, will send an email out to the listing agent, the buying agent, saying the house has made value. Uh, it's now going into underwriting to be signed off and underwritten by underwriting. Um, the process of going through underwriting, several items have timelines. Your pay stubs are only good for a month. Your bank statements are good for a month. Your 401k is good for 90 days, maybe 30 days. So we set the expectation that as we go through this, those items are going to need to be updated because your file has to be delivered on the secondary market as a performing loan based on the last greatest entities before closing. Right. So what is the typical processing time from start to finish? I make application to the closing table. What is that typically? A conforming like? loan, FHA loan, will do it in 30 days. A jumbo loan, I ask for maybe 35, 40 days, just because depending upon the price point, there may have to be two appraisals done. Gotcha. And so we have to have that time frame in order to get the first one back 
and then order the second one. We can't order them both at the same time. We can't have two appraisers showing up at the property, knocking on the door at the same time. Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> because underwriting is going to take the lower of the two appraisals if they both come in the same validating the uh, value on a jumbo loan, then we're okay. That's interesting. Okay. Um, and then so in that 30 days, underwriting really is the biggest portion of that, right? And Correct. underwriting is just your, how would you describe that? term i guess to an underwriter sector. sits in a magic cloud just joking <laughs> <laughs> they are and makes like your life the, miserable yes, okay. but <laughs> they are uh, seasoned professionals who have to who have different certifications that they go through to be an underwriter you just can't wake up and go i'm going to underwrite loans um they are highly trained and they take the program that we're submitting to them it's our job to frame your file meaning you're going to own a conventional loan, 5% down, here's insurance, here's your job history, your credit, your worthiness as far as how you've managed your credit and your, and your income. And so we submit that to underwriting and they go by the guidelines and they underwrite the file and they always come out with conditions. And then it's our job to satisfy those conditions. At the same time, when we've ordered the appraisal, the appraisal gets underwritten for the same guidelines the survey gets underwritten to the same guidelines. So we have to make sure, and the title commitment, that there are no outstanding liens on the buyers. The sellers will be satisfied at closing. Um, and so all of those things is the underwriting process, if that makes any sense to mm -hmm. you. And then when we get a clear to close, all of those have been signed off, checked off, and we can get in, do our 10-day post-closing, I mean pre-closing, but what we have to do, we pull credit, refresh the credit report to get you the CD ready to go out and be signed so we can close the closing date. So all these conditions that come up along the way, they are typical, right? It's, oh, I should normal. freak out no. if someone calls me and says, oh, I need another piece of documentation. Always, 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 yes. We try to minimize that. We try to get as much as we can and keep telling our clients we're going to keep getting these things from you, be it pay stubs, bank statements, and don't be surprised if processing calls you and says, by the way, your last pay stub is gonna expire in two days. The one thing we don't like is your driver's license is gonna expire. Let's hope you have a passport that's, <laughs> that, that would be able to be used. But um, So we look at all that documentation and try to keep everything current in the file. So don't be, oh, it's just one more piece of paper. It's just a process. And once you get on the other end of it, you're done and we get into closing. That's great. So what are some of the, in the underwriting process, um, what are some of the common roadblocks that you see happen um, and how do you kind of address those? Well, we're living through them right now. What did you call it? Snow? Snowmageddon. Snowmageddon, yes. <laughs> uh, with the snow and the extreme cold last week, internet went down, people had to work from home, pipes burst, they couldn't get to the office, appraisers couldn't get to properties, appraisers still can't get to properties, surveyors can't get to properties, title companies have reduced staff because a lot of their pipes have burst, it's just life. So we're going through that right now and trying to hold files together and refinance it together that we need the appraisals back in. They may or may not be pushed back further than what we need, so it's our job to make sure education and communication with everybody so there's no nervous people uh, that we're going to miss something uh, but if it's due to something like this then moving it a day or two everybody understands we're going to get there we just be patient we're waiting for those entities to come back in because it's a third party that's helping us help you mary i'm so excited about my brand new house I want to also buy a, a matching brand new car. No, you don't get to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Is that a good idea? No, it's not a good idea. <laughs> so, what about a washer dryer? No, no, no. <laughs> not a refrigerator, washer dryer, nothing. Um, when we get our clear to close, 10 days before your note date, before you sign, we have to refresh your credit report to make sure you did not go out and buy a new car or buy a washer dryer. That's going to make your debt to income ratios go up because we have to go back into underwriting to make sure that we have got a file that once your loan is closed and it's delivered to our capital markets, everything stays the same. So wait till like the day before and then go buy the No, car. go the day after. Okay. <laughs> the day so after. no new the day after. I'm debt. No new debt. debt. Until after you close. So when you get with our processing team, the emails that you get from them on the emails in big font in red it says do not create any debt for yourself 
<laughs> well, well, that's a good reminder. It's a great, great reminder. Don't look at the emails and go, no new debt. Because there's a reason for that. We just didn't put it on there. So um, we don't have many people that do that, to be honest with you, because that's the first thing I tell them. And it's reiterated all through the process to make sure that we stay the same, that we don't get out of our lanes and go do something silly like go buy a Maserati. Um, just don't do that because if you <laughs> want to do it, do it after closing. Don't do it before. But a friend of mine has a Maserati dealership and you can lease them really, really <laughs> expensive. <laughs> don't do that. Actually, I'm not I kidding. But <laughs> I know. Don't do that. So we've gotten through the whole process. We're ready to close. What closing costs can I expect? Good question. So if you escrow, you can ex probably expect about 3% of the purchase price to be what closing costs are going to be. Now that's also going to be determined about what area and what taxes and insurance. So it may be a little bit more, but that rule of thumb, 3%. If you don't escrow, you're probably looking at about 2%. Again, based on what your insurance is going to be, uh, because we'll collect a year of that up front. 2% uh, is a good rule of thumb. And what is escrow? Look at escrows as small bank accounts. We're going to set bank accounts up for taxes and insurance. Some lenders call them impounds. We call them escrow accounts. We'll collect three months of taxes to start your tax escrow, and we'll collect two months of your insurance to start your insurance escrow, so that when you make your payment, that's principal, interest, taxes, and insurance, We'll pull out the tax part and put it into your bank account for taxes, pull out the insurance and put it into your bank account for insurance. That way at the end of the year, December the 30th, the bills will come in for taxes and that will be paid by the servicer. Same thing for your insurance. The year anniversary of your closing date, another year has got to be paid. There's enough money in that account that the servicer will pay your insurance company for the insurance. So at closing, I need to bring my down payment, I need to bring a year's worth of homeowner's insurance, I need to bring up, bring the money to start my escrow Correct. accounts. What other closing costs are included? Well, there are title company fees. There are um, lender fees. We have two, Cornerstone has two, underwriting and processing, that's all. The rest of the fees that we show you are for your mortgage. So the appraisal fee that gets paid outside of closing, you get credit for that. There is um, the fee for the title company, for their closing part, there's title insurance that 99.9% .9 these wonderful agents will get the seller to pay the title policy for you. Then there is uh, recording fees, there are um, HOA transfer fees, there are a lot of fees that go along with that mortgage. So the 3% rule with escrows is a, is a really good rule of thumb that you can expect your down payment plus your closing costs. Now your closing costs are broken up into two parts. There are your prepaids, which are setting up your one year of uh, one year of homeowners insurance, plus your escrows, three months of taxes, two months of insurance, and the interest you'll pay on the note for three or four days prior to closing. Then there are closing costs, which are the title company fees, your lender fees, appraisal fee, all of those are separate. So when we send out cost analysis, you'll see closing costs and prepaids, and they get added together for your total closing costs. And you send a statement out that describes oh, what everybody's going to absolutely. be um, It's funny, we'll get, well, so-and-so is not charging me that. I said, you know, you can bring this to your closing. <laughs> and, you can, and you can sit down because they're not showing you fees that they should be showing you. Right. right. Um, we are held as lenders, lenders to a tolerance. If we say a title commitment's going to be X and it's Y and it's more than 10%, I have to pay the difference. So oh, wow. That makes, makes us very uh, precise and clear with our sharpened pencil <laughs> what we can do. Now, sometimes we will elevate fees by maybe $10, $20, so that if we don't know exactly what it is, we'll be within that tolerance. And so I tell our clients, a discussion today with a client before I got here, all of this will get settled by closing because all of those final fees will come and the ones we disclose to you that may look a little high will come down to what they actually are. So I have one question. Say um, somebody's a little tight on cash or they want to save their cash so they can do a home improvement or paint or whatever little, little item they might need the extra money for. Sellers can make some contributions toward closing costs. Right. 
I'm assuming that it differs depending on what kind of loan program you go with. So can you explain that yes. a little bit? If you've got an FHA loan, the seller can pay up to 6%. So if the house is $200, you know, they can pay twelve thousand dollars of your closing. Two hundred thousand, you mean? Oh, two hundred thousand. <laughs> you got a really good. Where's deal that two hundred dollars? I was thinking. I'm kidding. Uh, yes, they can pay twelve thousand dollars towards your closing costs. Now, closing costs are probably not going to be twelve thousand dollars. So it's incumbent that you get with me and say, okay, Mary, here's the purchase price. Let's figure out what closing costs are going to be. Then I call you back and say, and that special provision is eleven foot. $8,500 or whatever, okay. seven right. five hundred. So that would be part of the negotiation yes. of the contract. But do it at you, closing. If you wanted the seller to contribute to uh, closing costs. And I, I'm just gonna point out one thing because this has happened to me before. Make sure that you get with your lender, whether it's Mary Lee or somebody else, and make sure that you don't ask for more than that person oh. can legally or give you because the money goes nowhere and you don't get the money they can only give you what they're allowed to give you based on the loan so just know that VA and FHA are up to six percent if you put five percent down a conventional loan the seller can pay three percent if you put ten percent or more down the seller on a conventional loan can pay six percent okay good to know all right well it looks like that's all of our questions for now mary we really appreciate oh, your you. time enjoyed this. thank you so much um if you guys have any other questions about the financing piece you can reach out to ellen or i or directly to mary lee you can contact her at mary lee that's m-a-r-y-l-e-e -E, at houseloan.com um stay tuned for more segments if there's any topics that you guys want to see covered let us know and we'll try to get on the schedule thanks guys thank, thank you, you. Your, how would you describe that term, I guess, to our An underwriter members. sits in a magic cloud, just joking. <laughs> <laughs> they are and makes your life miserable. Yes, yeah. All right, I'm going to pause. Just <laughs> okay, did that sound right? It's, this is not comedy hour. This is yeah. great. <laughs> great. I got it. Okay. So then on the percentage that you expect to put down or of, of your closing costs, what if you're doing five percent down, let's say, let's just start that again. <laughs> okay, hang on. Okay.